Welcome to the Crash the Pond podcast. It is a Thursday, July 7th edition of the show. It is a draft day edition of the show. And in honor of that, in honor of a very entertaining first round of action, we've got a full squad. We've got a full squad, a full forward line here. Jake is with me, of course, as always. CJ is with us. So guys, I think we've, we've worked through some tech issues to get to this point. But I think we're in good shape now, and we're going to make the most of it. Oh. Oh, okay. boom. What'd you open it's a, up? It's like that, huh? It's uh, from Hey Yo D-Flo, uh, Ballast Point, California, Kolsch. Yeah, I think seeing seeing Jake uh, try to to cope with uh, tech incompetencies, I think you've, you've earned the beer. Yeah, it's been bad. There's a reason why the video does not look like it normally does. Also, let me know if you guys like this video look better than the other way, because if you do, then we can just leave it like this. There's a whole lot of options we have, but uh, yeah, so this is how the, the video will look for right now. Hopefully, it will all be fixed if uh, I can actually get someone coming out uh, tomorrow and fixing my setup. So, yeah. yeah. Bing, bing. I was on the phone for an hour before this. Let's go with that. Yeah, so apologies to everyone tuning in live, but for everyone that's listening to this after the fact on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, whatever, none of this applies to you. But we, yeah. we, we try to, we put a lot of effort into the front end with the live stream because that's just a fun part of this. But for, for the majority of people, it's, it's going to feel seamless. So with all that said, we're going to get into the Ducks picks, but I do want to point out that today was one of the craziest days in NHL, just scuttlebutt hot stove in, in a long time. And I'm not sure if I'm, if I've yet fully grasped everything that just happened. Alex to got traded for three first round picks. I feel like that's probably where we should start. To be honest, it's that the Anaheim ducks, we we've, we've talked about it. This, this whole off season so far since the duck season ended that this is the offseason to take a big swing, to go after a Kevin Fiala, to go after an Alex DeBrincat, to really try to hit big and leverage the cap space, leverage the assets that you have. And now Alex DeBrincat has been traded to the Ottawa Senators for three uh, picks. Kevin Fiala, we've talked about, has been traded. All of the, and you know, Jacob Chikrin is still out there, but really the big kind of core pieces are gone. And Jake, I guess just your reaction to that about how what this means for the ducks moving forward um i think it just means that maybe there wasn't a deal to be made that met what those teams wanted and it seemed like chicago for debrinket really were dead set on getting into the top 10 that's at least the what i had heard was that uh they were dead set on getting someone and they had an offer from someone in the teens and that would not have put them in a position to take that player and as we found out that's kevin korchinski and so it really felt like kind of this was a deal that was meant to be for them. Maybe you wish the Ducks would have been able to be in on that. I definitely do. But there's going to be more deals, I think, to be made. It's not as if now that uh, Debrinket's off the board that and Fiala's off the board that um, there's not going to be any more deals at all. And I think that's my biggest thing because there's been a lot of talk around, whether it be in our Discord, whether it be on Twitch or Twitter, whether it be in different places about um, – well, is this any different than Bob Murray? Uh, what are the Ducks doing? They they didn't make any of the big deals, and it's well. It, I think kind of my view of it is there's going to be plenty more deals. This is day one of the off season. The Ducks aren't going to necessarily be in on every single deal. If we hit the start of the season and nothing's happened, nothing, no deals been made, we have the same roster. Then I think you have a reasonable, uh, you have a reason to maybe be frustrated, panic, who, whatever you want to do. But I think there's a little bit of overreaction right now and, and so I, I think that's the the only thing that i'm seeing that's a little bit frustrating overall when looking at the trades um in terms of something that i think was worth push worth pushing back on i will say to bring cat went for a lot less than i thought he would yeah cj is it time to write off pat verbeek as gm totally everybody panic fire you know run around screaming with your shirt off that's what this needs to be right now no i mean and we've talked about this a lot basically since this off season started right that the ducks are in a really kind of interesting position where they have 
the choice to either start building up, start making a run to the playoffs. I think they're in a very similar spot that the Kings were last year in the last off season. And uh, Rob Blake basically said, okay, you know what? We're going to try and start repeating the uh, competing. The rebuild is over. They signed Victor Arvidsson, um, Philip Deneau, and uh, the Ducks are in a similar spot. But at the same time, I think it's just, just as defensible for, for Beak to sit back and say, Hey, I'm not ready to compete yet. I want one more year of kind of a rebuild of letting things marinate uh, of building things up. And that would be fine too. And I agree though, that it's way too early to tell and it's way too early to say which way this is going to go. There's plenty of off season left. The free agency is going to, we know the ducks are going to be hit the cap floor. So we are going to see some, and it's just going to be a matter of, what is that going to look like? And it, are those moves going to be in support of Verbeek saying, hey, rebuild over and we're going to get going? Or are we going to have another year potentially you know, get into a super deep draft next year, get high up, have one more year before we decide, okay, we're ready to go. Um, so either way is defensible. It's just it's way too early right now to make the determination one way or the other. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the biggest thing there, right, is – it's day one of the draft and i think everyone's i think everyone's maybe a little impatient um and um and wants everything done right now basically and i i think with a new gm new things they they want everything to happen and i think that's just not how the offseason necessarily works and i think one thing we have to remember is something you've brought up cj which is that the Ducks have to spend this offseason. This team's not going to be the same as what it came, in, or what how the season ended. There's going to be differences. Verbeek is going to put his uh, his uh, mark on this team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's that's something to keep in mind. I, for me personally, I will say that not getting these bigger pieces. To me, that was the ideal for the Ducks to really leverage the position they're in and find a way to improve the team and take that big step forward immediately. Um, but all things considered, that it's not just up to the Ducks whether or not that happens. I don't think that fans can completely hold that against them because if you think about it, for example, Alex Dabrinkit and the situation that he was in, do we know that he's going to be willing to sign an extension with whoever traded for him? Do we know that he's going to be in Ottawa beyond next year? To me, the, the, the price that he fetched kind of reflects the fact that there is uncertainty with his future. And if you're the Ducks, I don't really know if it's super worth it to actually go and spend all of this draft capital for a guy who might not stick around. So I think that that's fair. You know, the Kevin Fiala thing we've talked about, I don't think that it's really time to freak out if you're someone that's following the Ducks and, and looking at it from that perspective. So I think you can put the pitchforks and knives away for now. Yep. Yep. Jake, how are you doing over there? I see your audio flickering on and off. And uh, it, it was me testing out something, seeing if I turned off my video, if maybe that would help. I don't a, think it did. I hear, I hear a cat meowing. Yeah, that, that, yeah, this is just like a complete mess for me of Salem's on my desk, walking on my MacBook that's then playing audio. This is just one of, this is one of the biggest shit show episodes I think we've had in terms of just all things running against me. I mean, maybe the Mitch Brown episode was worse. Yeah, well, we'll get through this episode a little more quickly. Let's just let's just hit the main points. I think that what people want to hear is just about who the Ducks picked and what it means moving forward. So, 10th overall pick, the Ducks select Pavel Mintyukov. And this is someone that we actually, if you listen to our, our last show with Mitch Brown and also on our show with Chris Peters, talked about Mintyukov extensively. And, you know, especially... Mitch Brown made the case for Mintukov as being a guy that could potentially be targeted by the Ducks. I really landed by today on Frank Nazar as the guy that I wanted to go to Anaheim, who I thought made the most sense. You know, watching Frank Nazar play, there's a lot of Troy Terry in his game, uh, very a lot of similarities there. But Mintukov makes a ton of sense to me. He is an offensive defenseman. He brings that dynamic, more game-breaking element from the blue line than any other defenseman really that the Ducks currently have in their system. Maybe not Zellweger. Zellweger's maybe the exception to that. But Jamie Drysdale, for as fleet of foot as he is, he's not really an offensive-minded defenseman. He's a guy who's excellent at moving the puck up ice, at making the play 
to get it to someone else who can then make that play. Mintukov is a guy who's going to be more aggressive, who you're going to have to rein in a little bit, but he's got that that mind for it, and that's really important, and he's got the tools, he's got the size. It's an exciting pick for me, at least. I think that this makes a lot of sense for the Ducks. CJ, what do you make of this pick? Yeah, I, the one word that comes to me, to the top of my mind for Mintukov is the is the word dynamic. If there is ever a player in this draft, specifically a defenseman in this draft that you can call having a dynamic skill set, it's going to be Mitchukov. He's going to get up into the play. He has no problem activating off the blue line. In fact, sometimes that's where he can maybe get into a little bit of trouble is when he activates off the blue line, potentially loses the puck, goes the other way. But, you know, in the right system with the right development, that can be mitigated to some extent. So he's going to be a guy who's really fun to... If you look at uh, a lot of top kind of like offensive dynamic type of uh, uh, defensive players um, like Kale McCarr. I'm not saying he's nearly as good as Mikhail McCarr. That's almost impossible. But like you look at a Kale McCarr, Mira Heiskanen, um, those types of guys who really, really like to get involved in the play. Um, Mintukov is going to be in that same kind of vein and some of that similar play style. And if you've seen some of his highlights, some of his best highlights are effectively him basically burning forwards and almost kind of being a forward himself, putting on some dangles, getting in onto the net. This is a guy that if you need some extra scoring out of your blue line, this is a guy who's going to give it to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that the thing that's really important for me in Mintukov's game is that, you know, he's, he's a, he's a good skater. You know, he, he's might not be the most fluid skater, but he's got that mobility. He's smart with the puck. He's able to make the right read, make the right play. Not just, you know, like you talked about activating off the blue line, but also getting the puck up ice, making the right read and the right reaction. The biggest selling point to me, though, on Mintukov, outside of just the creativity and kind of that that flair, that, that flair that he has with the puck, it's more so that he's a guy when he's in the offensive zone because you, I think you see every year in the draft and even in the NHL, that there are defensemen whose stock gets really inflated offensively because they put up a lot of points. And when you really dive into how they're getting their offense, a lot of their points are just point shots that found a way through deflections, you know, one timers from the point. It's just these, these kind of lower value shots that are really, you know, that are really variance prone. And with a guy like Mintukov, the biggest selling point in one of the scouting reports about him is that he's a guy who's always looking for the better play, the better shooting angle, who's looking to get into the offensive zone, who's looking to beat that first man, get into the face-off circle area, get into the middle of the ice. That's to me, and we we talked about it on the last show, that's the modern offensive defenseman in, in today's NHL. It's not a guy who's spamming point shots. It's a guy who's actually able to, like you talked about, activate a little bit, but also when he does have the puck, make that extra move, or when he doesn't have it, get into those quiet areas, get a little lower or higher, however you want to talk about it, in the offensive zone, get into that circle area, and then create from there. That's when you're going to start pulling defenses apart. That's when you're going to start putting guys in real trouble because all of a sudden there's that extra, uh, there's that extra facet to account for. You actually touched on it with Kale McCarr, but Kale McCarr, one of the big reasons... I think why the Colorado Avalanche were so hard for teams to defend is that Kale McCarr adds this. He's like another forward almost. He's another threat that you have to account for. And Matukov is clearly not on that plane. Neither of us are trying to make that comparison. Yeah. But it's the same concept. And he's got that. And I guess from your perspective, what do you make? Because we had, for example, Chris Peters on last week, and he talked a bit about how he had mocked Connor Geeky to Anaheim and, and his reasoning was that, well, they have the high end forward talent. They have the, the high end blue line talent. So now it's time to add in a guy with more jam. It's, it's time to add in a guy who can kind of fill out that depth. What do you make of that? Is, you know, is this, does it would have made sense to have drafted maybe quote unquote for need? Where do you stand on just adding a, a good player to your pipeline? I mean, when you look at this draft and you see kind of all the rankings and all the analysis of them, I think it was pretty clear that 
honestly, in my opinion, the Ducks probably had at least six, seven, eight different guys who you could have justified going at number 10 overall. Connor Geeky, I think, would have been completely justified, in in my opinion. Um, really, what they are looking for, for me, what it comes down to is, and I mentioned this earlier today on Twitter, you draft the best player available. Now, there were a lot of guys who you can make an argument for being best player available for the Ducks at number 10, but internally for the Ducks, this is a perfect example of don't overthink it. Make your list, see who gets picked. Whoever's at the top of your list that is still sitting there when it comes number 10, you go with that person no matter what your need is, whether it's defense, center, goal scoring, anything like that. Because as soon as you start drafting specifically based off need especially in the upper half of the first round that's how rebuilds die really quickly essentially what you want you want to have the best potential um skill pool out of your prospects and out of your pipeline as you can and from there you can deal them if you need to you can deal you know maybe now that the the ducks have drafted uh, and we'll get to the gachet pick in uh, you know in a little bit but maybe now that they drafted another center who maybe profiles as a 3c or a 4c or something like that does that make somebody like lundestrom expendable for goal scoring or another need you know you can never ever ever have enough high-end talent even if you have like six talented centers and you know they're not going to be there you're going to be able to use that as an asset to flip later on so i think that and i i truly believe and because martin madden preached it for days kind of leading up to the draft that he was all about best player available i truly believe that minchikov was the best player available when they had up there and i think they got their guy yeah yeah, absolutely. I, I think I agree with all of that, which is that, yes, you know, the Ducks do have good defense prospects. That doesn't mean they're all going to pan out. There might even be a scenario where, you know, only one or two of them pan out. You you just never know. And even if they do have a lot of blue, blue line prospects, they did not have any blue liners in their system with the skill profile, with the player profile of a Pavel Mintukov. Not even close. Not even close. And that's exciting because now you have a different dynamic. And I understand Olin Zellweger is very good offensively. I think that him and Mintukov are just different types of players. I think Zellweger is a better skater. (laughs) Uh, Just a lot more dynamic, a lot more shifty. They're different players. Maybe I'm being a little harsh there with that statement. But the whole point is that even if Zellweger is great right now, you still don't don't know if he's going to pan out either, right? It's exciting right now. There's a good chance that he does pan out, but you still don't know. So why why rest on those laurels? And so now to me, if you're the Ducks, it's a really exciting time because you look at the blue line depth that they have in the system, in the pipeline, as Jake rejoins us. Welcome back, Jake. Thank you. What did I miss? How many, how many uh, holes have you punched in your drywall so far? Surprisingly none. Surprisingly okay. none. I'm glad. I'm glad. It's, it's out of your you control. You are oddly chipper. It, it's out of your control. Yeah, you just got yeah. You just you just got to ride with the chaos. Don't either worry. that he's either chipper or that tone is like I am hiding a complete meltdown and I want to die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we're we're getting through it here. So I think now you look at the Ducks pipeline on 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 the blue line. Jamie Drysdale obviously is the headliner. Olin Zellweger, Pavel Mintukov, Drew Hellison, who they got at the trade deadline. Then you go into some of the deeper ranks. You know Henry Thrun. Jackson Lacombe, Tyson Hines, Ian Moore. Hell, Jake, your favorite, Axel Anderson. How could we forget him, Axel Anderson? The the, the key piece of the Andre Kasha trade. That's a good group of defensemen. And and I, I love and I love the idea of having a bunch of really good defensemen. Hell, if you look at the Ducks uh last contention window, one of the things that made them as dangerous as they were is that they had a lot of good young blue liners coming through the system. Right, you think back to when they had Shea Theodore, Brandon Montour, Marcus Pedersen, go down the list. Hampus Lindholm, we dra- they drafted really high. I don't know if this is quite on that same level, but it's getting there. It's pretty yeah. interesting. And and I want to just jump in here. You guys have probably talked about Mitsukov a bunch now, but I want to add this. Don't know if you said it, but this came from our good friend, uh, friend of the pod, Mitch Brown, in the uh, scouting report on Elite Prospects draft guide, but said Mitsukov's puck skill is unique for a defenseman. He easily beats defenders with sound form, hand speed, and projectable setups, but he doesn't overuse them. He plays a give and go style based on short and medium range passing, constant movement, and nonstop pressure. 
And that's yeah. the modern day defenseman. That's exactly what you want to hear. And you look at his tracking data. I mean, granted, it's only eight games tracked, but Manjikov rates that rates out as a 100 overall based upon that data. He's great at preventing entries against. He's great at exiting the zone with possession. He's great at entering the zone with possession. And he's able to set up uh, shots and get some great shot assists and create shots for himself. Like, he is an all-around one of the best defensemen you can really find in this class. And depending on where you look, I think Cam Robinson may have even said on the, the PDO cast that he had him as high as... Um, he had him up there with uh, Juracek and Nemec. So it really depends on where you look. I mean, the consensus had him in the teens typically, but I mean, elite prospects had him as good as seven or as high as seven. And, yeah. and so this is this is a very good player that I think maybe got knocked because he doesn't play necessarily a physical style, and he's not the biggest guy. I mean, he's six one. He's not like I think that was a big reason why teams like Korchinski over him was Korchinski had the size, and Chris Peters even mentioned that. But I'd rather pick the skilled guy over the the guy that just has size, and so I think the Ducks are getting. Uh, I mean, by elite prospects, I don't know if you guys had seen this, but they ranked their their different defensemen in different categories. Minchukov was the number one best offensive defenseman, the second best defenseman in transition, and the fourth best vision in the entire draft class. Yeah, like. Yeah. This is a guy that is could be a steal of the draft. And the Ducks, I mean, Felix and I were talking briefly on the phone as I was driving home um, from work today, but the Ducks could on the left side in two, three years have um, have Fowler, Zellweger, Minchukov. Yeah, all high I mean, end, all high end puck movers on as you're, you're on the left side. Mm -hmm. Like these are not low quality talents. This was not a reach by the Ducks. Some people might say that because he was ranked in the teens. This is a bit of a swing, but this is him and Nazar were my best player available on the board. <laughs> I like how you've, I think now you're up to like four different pronunciations. 100%. Nazar, Nazar, who yeah. knows? Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not going to have to say it again after this, so I'm just going to keep going with it. Well, I think that it's just, it's a great kind of Martin Madden-esque pick where it's clearly valuing offensive upside. It's, you know, the tools are there for Pavel Mintukov, so it's not just like a pure gamble like a Brad Lambert, right, which is someone that people really wanted who we'll talk about at some point. But he's got all of it. He's got, I think, he, like you said, he is like that modern offensive defenseman, and that is really tantalizing. And I think now, you know, Olin Zellweger is a very exciting prospect, and no doubt he's looking like he's on track to become potentially an NHL star offensively. But it's not a guarantee. And so having another guy like that with a different skill set, who's a lot more rangy and who's a bit more of a, you know, of a wild card out there. That's just, that's just more potential variance that could work in your favor. Look at and the Colorado avalanche. Exactly. You can't have enough good players. And in a few years, the ducks could be in a situation where they're another one of these kind of all out offense teams that can also defend and that can keep up with teams defensively because they move so well. So this is just a really good step in that direction. Yep, 100%. Yep. Um, I My pick, again, I we talked about earlier, would have been Frank Nazar. I think that he, I mean, he was what? Like, at worst, top five to me forwards in this draft. Like, so, so good, so complete. Mm -hmm. And he would have helped the Ducks a lot. That's who I would have taken. But Mintyukov, to me, is like the Nazar on the, on the back end. And so, yeah. For yeah. me, the, the three players I had really kind of highlighted for this pick now that Savoy was off the board was Matejchak, Minchukov, and and uh, Na Nazar. However, we're going to pronounce it. Um, we've and, we've and, got it down, by the way. Have we? I don't know. I keep it. The we thing have. is, I, I hear it like 10 different ways every single time. But I, I think that any of those three, I think, is the perfect pick for this team. And... I think, I mean, I said this, but look at the Colorado Avalanche. Not saying that Zellweger or Mitchukov are going to become a Kale McCarr, but look at how they won the cup. They... CJ made that comparison, so... Oh, perfect. We're on the same page. But you yeah. look at that. They they had Kale McCarr. They had Bone Byron. Like, they were yeah. set down on their D with puck-moving guys. This is where the game is going. It's a transition-heavy game, and you have to be able to break out, and you have to be able to lead the rush. Or not lead the rush, be able to, to make a breakout pass to get the rush going, exit the zone, and be able to pitch in with a five-man unit in the offensive zone. And that's what Minchukov does. And, and so, to me, I mean... I'm just going to go ahead and give it. Let's give this a grade. I give this an A or an A plus, to be honest, taking Minchukov right pick. here. This pick. This pick. 
I, yeah. I would get that. But I, I want to add something, Jake, because I think mm-hmm. you bring up a really good point and something that I think gets missed in the Colorado comparisons when it comes to defensemen, too, is that, you know, people say like, OK, we need a winger. We need that. Well, here's the thing with the defensemen. Now the Ducks have a, you know, on paper, a very deep defensive pipeline. And look at what Colorado did. You had Sam Girard who went down with a broken sternum and they didn't miss a beat because they had the depth on the back end to absorb that, right? And yeah, they may end up trading Girard because of that, but they kept him around. And when he went down, they were no worse for the wear. So that is what you are really looking for when you are building a Stanley Cup contender, not just a playoff contender. And this was one of my big gripes during the last Ducks contention window that Bob Murray kind of refused to do. It was just amass these high-end talents so that if somebody goes down, then you have the depth to be able to overcome it. We saw that uh, when John Gibson would go down with an injury, they lost to Nashville. Kessler's hip going out, they didn't really have much of a way to combat that. Getzloff started playing hurt in like the third round of the Western Conference Finals. They couldn't overcome that. You need the depth. You need to stock up the assets. Colorado has proven. Tampa has done that extremely well also. And now with the Ducks coming here and loading up their defensive pipeline, the Ducks theoretically on paper have a really deep defense core that they're going to be able to draw from when they're ready to contend. Yeah. And yeah. and just kind of want to add one other thing here. Uh, Elite Prospects has the essentially percentage chance of him becoming different pairings. He has an 18% chance to become a first pairing defenseman, a 15% chance to become a second pairing defenseman. So, I mean, that's relatively high when you're taking a guy like this to be a top, uh, yeah. well, it's like, like it's, a, a top it's, four defenseman. It's more, it's more like a one third chance of becoming top four. Yeah. Which is like re- really good when you're taking a draft, uh, taking a player. Like a I think, pe- I, yeah. I think people, I think people expect that you get a surefire top of the lineup guy at 10 and that's just not how it works. Well, especially not in this draft. You know, this yeah. this is a good this is a good draft, I think better than what people give it credit for, but it's not a it's not one of those drafts where yeah, the 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 the, the talent pool is so deep that there is there are still sure values in that range. Mm-hmm. There might not be any draft like that to be honest, but certainly not not this one. Yep. So, so I think do you do you guys want to move on to the the second pick the twenty second overall pick? Are are there any players taken just before Minchukov that you would have been liked to have seen oh. fall to the Ducks? Oh, just before Minchukov. Um, before or after? Either way, actually. <laughs> I was a big uh, Marco Casper person. Uh, yeah, you I were. Have, I I would have loved Marco Casper, and I feel like. You know, I, I personally consider Steve Eiserman to be probably the just best general manager in hockey right now. I think he'd be um, joined by Joe Sackett, who very deservingly won the Jim Gregory Award tonight, um, as well as uh, Breeze Boy. But um, it, the fact that he like took Marco Casper out there and maybe you know a couple picks higher, depending on who, which draft ranking you were looking at, it was like, huh, Stevie Y and I are on the same wavelength. Okay, I'll take that. Yeah, I'm not very high on Casper. I don't really, I don't Same. really love that pick for them because it just. Same. I'm well, sure he asked you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll be a fine player, but he doesn't seem to have much offensive upside, which is kind of like what I value in that range of picks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to me, as the draft was unfolding and we got to five, and David Yerchek was still on the board, I guess it wasn't too surprising. But I was like, oh, could he? Could he maybe start slipping a little bit? But he didn't, rightfully so. Arguably the best defenseman in, in this draft. So that was maybe a name, but it wasn't very a, a realistic one. To be honest, the, the top 10, I should say before the Ducks, kind of played out almost, I don't want to say almost exactly how we expected, but it was like one of the scenarios that we envisioned, I think, this to- the, the way that the first nine picks shook out. So... Obviously, I think the one thing that you can say that is was not expected was Korchinski at seven. Uh, I, I think that it is crazy to me that the Chicago Blackhawks traded Alex DeBrinket, their best trade chip, for you know a, a collection of picks, and they used that seventh pick that or the, the seventh overall pick to get Kevin Korchinski, who I guess in a way they were not in that position to begin with, so. It was kind of like found money for them, but they 
I don't know. It was it was a weird pick at seven. That being said, they got Frank Nazar at thirteen, so it kind of it kind of works out for them. You, you I could wonder. Just, you could just flip those two picks, and it looks so much better. But it is a little. I wonder, based on that kind of information um, that I was able to that Pagnota said on SiriusXM today about the fact that they had the trade offer for a pick in the teens, but did not think the player they wanted would be available then. I wonder if all those mocks that had Korchinski to the Ducks were right and they would have taken him. And I think that at the end of the day, Chicago did the Ducks a big favor by taking Korchinski there because I think Matejchuk's a better player. Or sorry, Minchukov is a better player. Yeah, well, well, I think both of them are. I know that you preferred Matejchuk to Minchukov. I did. I did, but I think that they were close. They were very close. And I think that Korchinski... I think the divide on Korchinski is pretty simple, which is that he put up the big numbers. He put up the equivalency numbers that will make him pop as a defenseman in, you know, like, for example, the hockey prospecting model of Byron Bader. But the people that I think watch him more closely, that looking more at the tools, the reads, all of that, that's where the disconnect is. Is He's got all these points, but does this translate to the NHL level? And it is a really hard thing to decide on, right? And, well, and do, you just, do you just trust the data or do you look at more of the bigger picture? I, I think it's a very difficult balance, and that's why potentially for Chicago, Korchinski could end up being a home run. Either way, it doesn't really affect the Ducks because they got Matejko. No. <laughs> well, I think that the difference is Korchinski's bigger. And I think that yeah. I think that is honestly the biggest difference between Korchinski and Minchukov is – at least from the traditional sense, if you're looking at Korchinski, he's the biggest guy. And so that's, I think, why teams can be valued him more. But I think what Mitch Brown said on, when was that, Tuesday, was pretty damning about him, that just the way he loses the puck in the D zone. Yeah. And and that's a huge concern. Yeah. I, I think that, to me, Korchinski has a lot of things that are really exciting about his game. Like, there's a reason he's being talked about in that, in that range. But I think that Mintukov just seems to be a better thinker of the game a better problem solver who just has more tools, more more puck handling skills to really execute on that. You know, if you watch Korchinski play, he's got skill, he's got mobility, but you can just tell that he's he just doesn't have the the toolkit. He doesn't have the the bag of tricks that a Mintukov does. And to me, I think that that projects better at the NHL level because the problems you're facing are going to get harder, and you need more ways to solve them. And that's what Mintukov is able to do in a way that I don't think Korchinski looks to right now. But again, Korchinski produced very well and it looks really good. And I don't want to completely discount that anyway. Bit I of think a, side, a big thing, I think a just a really debate. big thing just to add on Korchinski is the fact that like of all the picks in the top 10 in that first run, he is by far the most boomer bust. Like I don't yeah. see any real middle ground for Korchinski. Uh, He's either going to completely flame out or he's going to be a home run pick. And and I, I agree with you. I think the risks were just a little too much to overlook to justify taking him in the first 10. But um, I think Chicago obviously feels otherwise. Yeah, and I think this is something that we, I don't know if we were talking about, everything's blurring, whether we were recording when we were talking about this earlier. But it's something that we, we discussed also with Mitch Brown is that he had a lot of turnovers, Korchinski did. And it's not just that he had turnovers, it's that, they weren't necessarily turnovers that were the kind that, okay, he's trying something or this is something that's going to really, that you can fix and that will translate at the NHL level. It was more so running out of ideas, not really sure what to do, kind of just settling for a lesser option, you know, throwing it out, you know, on the glass. It's the problem solving skills. Yeah, exactly. And Mintukov doesn't have that issue. And I think for the Ducks, if they were targeting Korchinski, Maybe this ends up being a little bit of a blessing in disguise that they weren't able to grab him. He wouldn't have been a bad pick at 10. You know, I think it's more reasonable than at seven. Anyway, hypotheticals for sure, but it is interesting to think about. Um, So I will give this pick an an A grade. A grade. I mean, I don't really know if there are any A plus, A pluses to be handed out in this range. You know, like I don't. That's fair. You know, like it's just that kind of draft, but an A is really good because they made the most of their draft slot to me. I think that they they hit a very nice uh, balance of upside, and there is some floor there. Mm-hmm. He is Russian, but you know, just we've already talked about this. He's not one of those guys who you have to uh, you know pry out of Russia. He's already here, 
and he's I not think, going anywhere. Yeah, I think I saw something that him and some other people just with the the nature of Russia right now with what's happening over there with uh, various different athletes just in general, they're staying over here in the summer and they're actually not going back. And I think I saw that with Menchukov. He is staying in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, he was the one guy, I believe, who was like guaranteed to be staying in the U.S. I think a few other guys will probably be staying, but think, there were still some questions around. I think I saw Mira Shinchenko is going to be staying here or something like okay, that. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a pick that was by the Caps. Um, oh, great. Pick. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Well, then I'm giving it an A. CJ, did you give it a grade? I didn't. Um, I would... I would probably give it an A minus, and the only reason Ooh. I like am gonna throw the minus on there is that, um, you know, it wasn't the pick I would have made. I think it was a very good pick and and mm-hmm. and very defensible, and and I see Manchukov being a critical part of the Ducks blue line for years to come. That said, I do think there I maybe would have gone forward at that position. Yeah. I think there may have been a little bit higher ceiling forward guys out there. Like to me. You know, I had been cool on Nazar, you know, Nazar, whatever you want to call it for see, a little while. See, see, um, thank you, thank but, you. But he has, in my opinion, tremendous upside as well. And so, um, yeah, I think that I would have maybe gone a little bit higher upside on the forward type of thing. But um, overall, as far as, you know, if you're going to go with a blue liner, um, Majukov is probably the best that the Ducks could have gotten at that pick. Also, can we celebrate? First time the Ducks have taken a Russian in yep. like the top couple rounds since Stanislav Chistov. The Murray yeah. Russian ban is over. Woohoo. Yeah. Yeah. Straight up. I mean, he like he's Russian. not a, yeah, he's, he's, you and I talked about this on the car, but it, he's like, he's been in the U S it's a little bit different than someone yeah. that's in the yeah. KHL. They're not getting him with that uncertainty, but still it, it I would Bob Murray have, have drafted him. Who knows who cares? Uh, let's get to the 22nd overall pick. I think this is the one that probably, I don't want to say soured me on this first round because the Matukov pick is so good, but the Ducks pick Nathan Gaucher, uh, 22nd overall. You know, you go into the Elite Prospects ranking, which which we've used so much of. You, he was he was in that top 32 group. He is a first round level player, and you look at the equivalencies, the the point models, like with Byron Bader. Not very exciting in there, you know, didn't really have the production that you would expect in that, you know, where he's at in his development. I think it was his third year in the QMJHL this year. He's got a lot of size. I mean, he's 6'3", 207, projects probably as a bottom six center who can, you know, who's a very good four checker, sound defensively, wins puck battles. A guy that really every team needs. It's just the question is, is that a guy that you really need to target with a first round pick. So I don't know what you guys think about that. So here's my take on this pick. Mm-hmm. I don't think I would have taken Nathan Gocher. I don't think on my board. Gocher? Goche, sorry. Your I'm American just, is showing. Yeah, Goche. I, I don't think I would have taken him with, I don't personally think he was best player available. I think there were other players I would have looked at instead. Having said that, I think there is a defensible Yeah, uh, it's not a bad pick. This. No, and and, and just to give some background here on, on him, I like the elite prospect scouting report. They really do a lot of, a lot of information or put a lot of information into it. Um, this is uh, basically about Goche saying, the certainty of Goche's projection is the reason why we included him on our top 32 board this season. Few players possess his combination of power and speed, his physicality and motor. These attribute, uh, tributes give Goche a stronger NHL foundation than most. On their own, they could earn him a long career in the league if he learns to maximize them. He's already a fierce four-checker, someone who can knock opponents off the boards, steal pucks from them, protect them long enough to find an outlet with a deft backhand pass. Those passes were a trademark of Goche's game all season long, his ability to slip pucks around or under sticks of opponents to open teammates allowed his team to quickly transition the puck from zone to zone. Uh, another blurb is despite the lack of high end playmaking and manipulation abilities in his game, his passing precision and ability to fire off passes uh, uh, still give Goche upside. If he can revi- refine his timing and deception, he could become a mainstay on a top six line. Down the road as a complimentary forward, a puck retriever, defensive presence, and finisher. While it's more likely that Goche ends up being moved to the wing due to his small area skill set, he also could hold on to a center position due to his ability as a quick distributor. Yeah, I mean, that's my whole thing is that I don't really see him right now as a... I also love how you just read that whole page. Or no, almost all of it. But that's good. Half, half. Half. But I think that 
it makes sense the notion that he might not hack it at, at center in the NHL because he doesn't really have the skill set that you need in terms of the the playmaking ability, the small area skill. So that's a good that's a good note. Um, but he is fair, like you know the the athleticism, the physicality, and just kind of everything else. It's good enough to where he is still a first round talent. And so I I know that people aren't excited about this pick. I'm sure. I know that people wanted, you know, Brad Lambert or take a take a big swing on like a Daniela Yurov or Isaac Howard or something like that. But this isn't a bad pick. I don't want people to look at this negatively, even if it's not exciting. And also, oh, by the way, I'm just going to say it. I think that Martin Madden has earned some benefit of the doubt just a little bit. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's he's not perfect. No one is. But I think that we have to give him just a little benefit of the doubt here. And one one thing I want to add here, and I think this is something I kind of came to the idea of when kind of really thinking through this pick, because a lot of the the negativity around Goche was it's a safe pick, it's a floor pick, all these different things like that. And I think that shouldn't necessarily be a knock. And I think you can't simply draft upside all the time. Yeah, I think at a certain point, you do have to have some floor players if you're rounding out your prospect group. You yeah. can't just have your entire group be the same exact type of players. And so I think having a Nathan Goche in your system, and if he was a top 30 pick, which he was, and he went, at, he was ranked 25th by a league prospect, he went 22nd, like not that far off from their ranking. Um, it's not a bad pick. Like I said, it goes against what kind of I think the three of us view for methodology with draft. We're very much a draft for upside, draft for upside, draft for upside. But that's also because we're fans of the team and want to see fun players. I think when you're constructing a team, you have to consider all these different guys that you have in your system. And I think at a certain point, you do have to add some floor players there. And you can't just do that later in the draft because there's a reason why floor players don't go later in the draft. They get drafted earlier because teams want those guys because they're more certainty. So, sure, Brad Lambert, maybe he would have been a better pick, but there's a lot of uncertainty there with him. Uh, like, who his season was so bad this year in terms of his point production. Who Brad, knows what Brad he's Lambert might be. not have a floor. <laughs> yeah, like, that's the that's the thing. A lot of people say, um, a, a lot of people say, like, Brad Lambert, Brad Lambert, Brad Lambert, but I think that's missing just how rough his season was. And CJ and I actually discussed this before we went live, but they're... Pat Verbeek, Brad Lambert doesn't seem like a Pat Verbeek guy because Verbeek constantly talks about compete. And for those that don't know, one of the reasons why Brad Lambert played on two different teams was he had a falling out with his off-ice uh, off work with one of the teams where they just straight cut him. And then he re-signed with the Pelicans who he played with in his teenagers, younger, mid-teenagers. And so um, it, it's not as if he's a for sure thing either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I, I want to make a, a couple of points here, which is that, you know, there are drafts where I think like my philosophy, like you said, our philosophy is that, yes, you want to go for upside because you can get these kind of players like Gaucher. Maybe you can get them in, in free agency and, and fill out your roster with them. But if you can still have one of these guys on an ELC who's playing at a good level, that's still a good value add. You know, ELCs are, are a big commodity. And secondly, I just don't really think this was a, this is a draft where there's all these guys kind of lurking in the in the end of the second round or sorry end of the first round early second round like you see a lot of years that you do want to take swings on like like we talked about with Brad Lambert like he he might not have a floor and then Daniela Yurov might who knows what that situation is going to be you know like there's just not there weren't very many names where I can sit here and say oh. They they messed up by not taking a swing on that guy. So yeah, it's more it's more so the absence of an alternate option that's so much more exciting that makes me not that critical of this pick. Yeah, there's there's a couple guys, uh, a couple people in the chat who I think put it really well here that this was the draft of three C's, right? Like especially mm -hmm. when you're looking at forwards, kind of in the second half of the first round, most of these guys are projecting out as essentially bottom six guys, maybe a few, you know, middle six guys you might find in there, but that's just kind of the nature of this draft. But what I will say, and I think that this was put really well, um, Brock Otten, who is the um, uh, director of scouting for McKean's hockey. Um, I think he put this really well where he basically said the reality is players like Nathan uh, Gaucher get traded for first round picks every deadline. He has a game tailored to being a playoff performer. So if you're thinking of playoff performers of these big 
heavy guys. And I know we bash on that a decent amount, but you have guys like, and some Ducks fans may not like me for bringing this up, but like Pat Maroon, for instance. Pat Maroon is a big guy. He can check. He can forward check. He protects players. He's tough. But at the same time, he does bring some of that skill as well to where he can contribute. And he's not just a big body. And he's the kind of what a lot of teams consider to be the prototypical playoff performer. Gouche kind of has a similar profile to that. Not saying that he's going to end up being that guy, but the profile is there. So I can see the logic behind it. Want a better example? Yeah. Uh, Val Nichushkin. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't go that, that far. That, that is a little bit yeah. of a stretch, but I think that he's probably closer to Val, Val Nichushkin than a Pat Maroon, if you're thinking about a guy that can get in on the four well, I, th- I think he, I think I think Gouche has got a better, better, better skating stride, like, yeah. projects to have a better skating stride than a Pat Maroon does. Yes, 100%. And so that's yeah. kind of my point is Val Nichushkin's a guy that gets in on the four check, makes it hard to break out against, and is able to set up plays. Maybe uh, that's a high ceiling for Nathan Goche, but uh, that might be a guy to kind of put as the essentially the, the, the pie in the sky for what he can become. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's some Nick Paul comparisons in our in our chat, which I don't think are terrible either. Just like a big guy who can skate, who can make plays. I mean, that's kind of what you're you're projecting out there with Nathan Gaucher. And I do think that eventually as the Ducks, you know, uh, as the Ducks player development staff and department gets better, there's going to be a point where they're going to be able to turn these guys more quickly into NHL contributors. It's been a weakness for them, but clearly they're working on it. And so I, I think that we're going to see where they're going to be able to, to hit more often than not because of that. So I don't hate the pick. I don't like love it either, but I also... I don't even like saying that I don't love it because I just don't really think that they're it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Okay and, and, and there's no, like, I don't, I just don't see the guy that they really missed on. I know people exactly. like Brad Lambert, but Brad Lambert to me is like huge, huge range of outcomes, like almost well, too big. This is kind of how I put it in our discord. When people are like, is he like, why didn't they take the best player available? I'm like, there's a world where, like, and this is probably what happened. Nathan Goche was probably the best player available on their list. Yeah. Like, yeah. That is, I mean, that, is, I mean, that is probably what it was. That's how teams typically draft, right, is they have their list, and a lot of them just, okay, who's up on our list at this spot with who's available? Okay, yeah, take and, that guy. And I think you put it best, right? Like, we may have had different people higher than him on our personal list based upon what we know, but neither of us, none of us have done the scouting first off the team does. And I think Martin Madden, like you said, has earned a little bit of our trust here. And so yes. if there is an argument for Nathan yeah. Goche to essentially potentially be best player available, I think he's earned that benefit of the doubt. Uh, of the doubt. And, 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 so. the other, and the other thing I want to point out as well is that with Verbeek coming in, we do have a little bit of shuffle in the development team for the Ducks. There is a changes there. Um, Marshawn's Marsha- out. is out. Marshawn is out. Um, you've got Scott Niedermeyer now kind of back more deeply involved with player development. Um, you've got these new people. You've got a new uh, head coach in San Diego that was just announced who coached in the Sharks Roy organization Summer. for yeah. a, a ton of years. You know, there are some personnel yeah, developments um, that are going on right now. And, and I can't say if they're going to be good, if they're going to hit, if they're going to improve. I don't know if there will be any change. But Verbeek clearly has um, kind of an idea in mind for what he wants the development staff to look like for Anaheim. And it's going to be different than it was in the past. Yeah. Yeah, and I think people are saying, and I, I don't disagree, that Isaac Howard is is maybe a guy they could have taken a swing on. It seems like the kind of player that the Ducks do take swing on late in the first round um, because he has that production, he has that upside. That I think looks- they pre- I think they potentially prefer taking a center that they could move to the wings compared to just taking a winger, though. Yeah, and I agree with Winterborn as well that, like, honestly, he should have just been a pick uh, based off of his fit. Like, the dude was just American hero outfit, so much swag. <laughs> the absolute cojones for that man to wear what he did to the first yeah. round of the draft. I love Isaac Howard simply for that. Yeah, and so I think that with Isaac Howard, yeah, maybe that's that's the one guy. But really, to me, that's kind of it, though. And like, like, to- like it's, it's not egregious if you miss on one guy when there's as opposed to when there's a few guys hanging around that you could have taken. And to be fair, like we mentioned elite prospects a bunch. Isaac Howard was in the forties for them. Yeah. No, they, he was they had the him first at, round guy. They had him at forty one when they have Nathan Goche at I mean to uh, me the twenty five. The, the the hype on Isaac Howard is about the points. It's about the production. And 
he played with Naz- uh, Nazar all season. Yeah, and he could end up making us look terrible. I mean, he's got, I mean, right now, 41% star probability in Bader's model, 63% NHLer. So clearly the production, like for, for a late first rounder, like that's an exciting player, but that still doesn't mean that he's going to hit that, right? It's not a for sure thing. If they had taken him, it would have probably been a more upside pick for sure. Maybe that would have been the correct pick, but all of this to say that Gaucher is not a bad pick in and of himself. Um, that's the whole thing. That's the whole yep. point. All right. Um, grades. Grades. Well, so on the whole, I think that the Gaucher pick, even though I've, I've just spent a bunch of time def- uh, defending it, I grade on upside and potential, you know, how, how much can this change the course of the franchise's uh, path? And I think that, you know, Gaucher doesn't exactly do that. So I'm going to give the Ducks first round a B plus. Oh, I meant where do you put the Gaucher pick by itself? Oh, <laughs> oh. And then we'll uh, get to that. B, I guess? Yeah, that's where I would have it. B or B minus. I, yeah. I think that, I think it, I think if you're basing it on what's around it, like there's not really anything else, but I think just, I think in some ways that's just indicative of what the pick is, is that it's a B it, it's fine. Right. Yeah, I, I, I would probably put it at a, at a C plus I'd be a little bit lower on that again, okay. kind of coming from the perspective of upside. And yeah. I think, you know, you, you made the extremely valid points of wanting to get some of those floor guys. And I think that's totally valid just based off my personal evaluation C plus I'd give the Ducks draft a solid, you know, B overall. Yeah. At least the first round. I'd probably go B plus. Yeah. To me, a, to me, a minus B plus. To me, B plus is, is kind of the most fair I can come up with. So anything else on the draft? Because Pat Verbeek did have some comments after the Eric Stevens uh, was posting that we can dive into a tiny bit and then maybe take some questions and get out of here. Somebody just met a message. And if we want to just go, over this really quick, um, you know, talking about Shane Wright dropping to fourth. Um, I don't think, you know, obviously there was a ton of debate around uh, Slavkovsky and Wright with Montreal at first overall, but I don't know if many people had him sliding all the way down to no. Seattle. There was and some it, chatter of that. Today. Yeah, it, it wasn't impossible. It wasn't impossible. No, it was a scenario that was out there. I, I wasn't too, too surprised to see that. It's still crazy to ha- to see it happen live, but... I love it for Shane Wright. I think it's a great landing spot. I think it sets up a really cool narrative of him kind of being the guy that got overlooked and he gets to go to a new franchise, kind of be the face of that franchise along with Matty Beneers and just prove people wrong. And I think it's it's going to be a really cool journey for him. And potentially the, the Seattle Kraken got the best player in the draft uh, at number four. But, you know, a lot of people had Slavkovsky going first. Simon Nemitz to New Jersey, honestly, is not surprising. I think that after Slavkovsky, it makes sense that they would pivot to a D-man because it just seems like they just weren't going to take a, a center. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Cooley, I thought, to Arizona makes a ton of sense, right? Like, that's 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 who's been mocked him over and over. And on top of that, like, that's they need an exciting player to put butts in seats. He's probably not going to be there with them right away, but he he has that, that ticket-selling ability and so Shane Wright at four makes sense for me, and, and it makes sense for the Kraken. It's going to be fun. I'm excited to, to see how those four guys play out for their respective teams. Oh, one thing um, I want to mention we haven't talked about yet, or maybe you guys did while I was out, but Matt's tick taps to uh, Pat Verbeek. It was his idea to have Mason McTavish come and announce the 22nd yeah, overall pick yeah, that was because awesome. he was not able because he had a virtual draft. And so he wanted to give him that ability to come and be on the podium and essentially have his draft day. Yeah. No, that was really cool. So I do want to point out here a comment from Pat Verbeek. Um, This is from Eric Stevens. Uh, Ducks GM Pat Verbeek said he had lots of trade conversations over the last few days, but there was nothing that arose where he was close to pulling the trigger on a deal. Alex DeBrincat is obviously a good player, but they're not ready at this point in their evolution to make that type of deal, which obviously would would have made for a huge financial commitment. So... Not really completely sure what to make of that, but it just sounds like the Ducks, It, like what we were talking about off the top, is that I don't think that the Ducks are necessarily, we don't know that they're not trying to make these deals happen. Basically. Yeah, and I wonder how much of that last part was Eric Stevens' speculation. That's kind of what that seems like to me and not yeah. necessarily yeah. Uh, Pat Verbeek stating that, right? Yeah, no, I, I think that that's, that is a lot more, it sounds like more like, like it's Eric Stevens saying that. Um, also saying that they're not ready 
to make that type of deal. Well, if Pavrobik is having lots of trade conversations, they have to have some readiness. And they have to spend money. They have to spend like twenty million. So I think made made a few huge financial commitment. They have to spend money. And we still have no idea whether or not again Verbeek is ready to make that jump to wanting to compete. You know, not trading for DeBrincat. Maybe some people might see that as, oh no, we're going to be in for another rebuild year. I don't think that says that at all. Uh, I mean, it just means that he didn't think that it was the right deal for them. But it, it is very important to remember as well that. Um, you know, again, still early going back to the don't overreact type of situation and the important context of that's more of Eric Stevens take on it rather than Verbeek. He's still yeah. playing his cards very close to the chest. To me, the big takeaway there is just that they, they were in on some talks. Um, yep. Outside of that, I mean, I think some interesting comments from Verbeek on Mintukov. He said that the games I watched him live, he was very skilled in traffic, could really think his way out of traffic. I mean, that's something we were just talking about. Those are special skills and very hard to find, especially in defensemen. We see him as going to be part of our core group moving forward. Also said that he checked all the boxes in terms of skill, compete level, and hockey sense. So, yeah, I mean, that's... Hockey sense. Word of the week for us, right? Well, it's just a buzzword. Um, I know. And then on Gauche said that he's a very good skater, powerful player, very aggressive player, and how he plays, doesn't mind stirring it up, and he's big. We're looking to get bigger. Uh-oh. The in- incoming Nick Delorier contract uh, signing? I hope not. Let him go somewhere else. <laughs> oh, the one thing I was at, I, actually actually something I wanted to say about that. There was a lot made right about Verbeek mentioning the the looking to get bigger thing, but a lot that was missed about that quote that he had earlier in the season was that, or I guess last season. Um, you mean getting stronger? He no, but he also had mentioned that I also need to get more skill and I need to get more speed to complement my skill and speed guys. Well, he, he basically of- said that they need everything. Yeah, but the no, but a lot of people were thinking that based upon that quote that the Ducks were going to be focusing on size in this draft, yeah. and, and with especially the tenth overall pick, and that was why some people thought uh, they were going to focus on Korchinski, the bigger guy. Yeah, and the, Mitch sorry, is not a big guy necessarily. I mean, he's six, he's not small. He's six one, but he's not like a physical presence. No. Yeah, the the thing to remember when it comes to size is that. There's a difference between wanting size as a complementary skill set and wanting size as your primary skill set. We've seen a lot of general managers who go, he's big, he's big. If you're leading with he's big, that's not necessarily a great thing. But size in hockey is an undoubted advantage based on the way just the game is played. The thing is, is that you want that size to come with some level of skill. That was one of the entire justifications for taking Mason McTavish third overall last season was the fact that, yeah, he was big. He had the NHL ready ready size. He has a physicality, but he has an amazing shot. He's got great hockey sense. He brings that skill along with it. And this is something that Steve Iserman has done for years in Tampa, now in Detroit. If we're, you know, taking for beak from the school of Iserman, it's kind of the same. It's reasonable to assume that he's thinking the same thing. He's not going to go out and just get a guy who's big when he talks about size. He's going to look for a guy who may be big, but at the same time, bring some of that skill set as well to help your team. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think all all things considered, it's uh, a good draft day, a good, a good first day for the ducks. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, do you guys want to maybe get into some questions from the chat? Yeah, let's do this. Um, we had a couple leftover uh, podcast questions from, uh, or we have one leftover uh, from um, uh, Tuesdays from Almighty Duck ninety three. Said, do the Ducks trade their second rounders? Maybe if they if they've been in on conversations, but it feels like they're just going to make their picks this year. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, yeah, so those of you in the Twitch chat, please put your questions in. So, yep, you'll find us on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash Crash where you can like and subscribe to the videos. I see all the YouTube comments. Please put questions there if you want them. I can reply to that. Um, and uh, those of you on your pod- favorite podcast services, you can find us at twitch.tv slash Crash where you can uh, support show. If you have Amazon Prime, you get one free Twitch Prime gaming sub each and every month. It helps support us more than you can imagine. You get special emails in the chat, special badges next to your name. And hopefully we'll have more stuff on the screen next time that you'll be able to see your name and stuff like that. But uh, we got this question, a couple of questions that have popped in right now. Uh, SSYJRR said, what kind of picks do you think GM... Uh, Pa, uh, I assume that's meant to be Pat Verbeek, PVB. Uh, we'll focus on tomorrow. 
What kind of trades? What kind picks. of picks? What kind oh, of picks? sorry. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's going to be a point where they start getting into some upside picks. So maybe Elaine Hudson, if he slides to them, right? Like, I think that there's going to be a point, right? I mean, some of the names like Sakura, Furcus that have been out there, Odelius, those are guys that maybe get targeted. But I think that you're going to see some upside plays because they haven't totally done that so far. Yep. Uh, let's see. T unit 1427, who are some targets for tomorrow? Personally, Sakura is for me. Yeah, I mean, I I would really I'm I know that Lane Hudson has gotten a lot of flack, um, even on this podcast, but I would be curious to see them take another swing at a blue liner. Yep. Yeah, I I, I like Hudson as well. Um, yeah, I I agree with the upside picks. Keep in mind though tomorrow too that the Ducks only have two second round picks tomorrow. Um, the other second round pick in addition to their, um, you know, usual one is, uh, from the Raquel trade, um, the second round pick from the Penguins and the Raquel trade, um, 2023, they have three second round picks. So that's when things really start to get interesting. We'll see if for leverages any of that, but, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree that I think this is where you're going to start to see a little bit more of the upside. And I think that also given the defensive pipeline getting stocked right now, I think you're definitely going to see probably a little bit more heavy uh, preference towards forwards and goal scoring yep. specifically. Uh, preferred nepotism pick. This comes from DB Lowry 3507. Havlid or Sakura? Is is Sakura Peter Sakura's son? I saw Havlid is Nicholas Havlid's son. I don't have an opinion on the second round guys and to that. I'm going to go with Matthias Havlid because he's ranked higher by elite prospects. But <laughs> either of those are great Ducks nepotism picks. There you go. Yeah. Bring it back. They have to wear the same numbers that their dad would on the, one on the Ducks. And you know what? When they come in, the Ducks should just change back to the Mighty Ducks jerseys also. Easy. Yeah. Done. There yeah. you go. Uh, Enormous Elephant said, with Edmonton and Toronto shedding salary, Gibson trade. So I saw the Toronto deal was Mrazek to Chicago for uh, along with the first for a second. What trade did Edmonton make to shed salary? Did I miss Cassian. that? Cassian. Wait, where did Cat? What? Arizona to Arizona. I, I so for anyone out there, I was busy for most of the draft. So I, what trades happened today? I mean that that those are really the two that I. Could okay, think of. Well, yeah. what was the Cassian deal? Because I did not see. Well, there this. was the San Jose deal as well, which was puzzling. Yeah, to say which the was least. bonkers. Yeah. What what I the you're breaking okay. news to me right now. <laughs> well, San Jose traded the eleventh pick for twenty seventh and like a second and a third or something. Oh, okay. Like so it was just picks being traded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that the Oilers and the uh, Oilers and Coyotes basically just swapped first round picks. It seems. And the the Coyotes took Cassian. Yeah. So nothing well, like I, super. I, super I think noteworthy. Edmonton is. I don't think Edmonton's going to be going after Gibson. I think supposedly he's on their no trade list. And I think they're clearing salary to go after Darcy Kemper. That, yeah. That's at least what it sounds like. Kemper's not going back. He wants, I think, like six times six is what I saw today. Uh, Toronto, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, love how it, Kyle this just basically said, screw goalies. We don't we don't give a crap about goalies. I mean, well, Colorado kind of just did that by letting go of Darcy Kemper. Um, I mean, what it sounded like today, Eric Stevens tweeted that the, the, the Gibson chatter has really died down that there was no Gibson chatter at the draft. And to me, it's like, well, if it's not going to happen with literally the entire league under one roof, doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but it's not an awesome sign, maybe. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I think I, I think I was of the opinion that um, we'll, we'll see tomorrow, but I was of the opinion that if John Gibson is still a duck by the time the draft is over, he's starting the season in Anaheim. Maybe. That's, maybe my, awesome. that's my guess. Maybe, it's maybe possible. not. Yes and no. Two sides we'll of see. every coin. <laughs> oh, God. Three sides. Ab- Ab- <laughs> Three sides. Yeah, Ava AG said, who won the Ducks trivia today? I don't know. He did. Oh. Have you not seen his new Discord handle? I didn't see. I, I yeah. haven't been in Discord. It, it's now said trivia winner. Oh, well, congratulations. Well earned. Just, just a rush guy. I'll reach out to you to get that mug sent your way. Just a rush guy. Any reasonable free agents you want to see signed? You know, I don't really have any like specific targets. I think if the Ducks just re-signed some of their guys, get like, the RV. Yeah, well, I know. Well, they'd have to trade for him. Yeah, but tra- it sounds like he can be had for like next to nothing. My my joke about Derek Grant in a second might actually be an overpay at this point. 
<laughs> well, I had heard that uh, they're no longer looking to deal him for picks. I don't know how true yeah. that is, but that so, was the last report okay. I had. Okay, Derek Grant and Sam Steele. <laughs> Done. God. The thing is, that might happen. It might. Yeah, it's true. Like, like based upon the what everyone's saying, that is not out of the question. Um. Uh, yeah, I don't really know any other free agents that I, are reasonable. Well, th- th- there was, no, uh, there's not. I mean, it's kind of an oxymoron because there's, there's no not, free agents that are reasonable. Yeah. Well, there, I mean, there I think was, there, I think, there was like, the report that like Colin White it may be available. I think he's an yeah. interesting guy. Oh, he's being bought at. out. Yeah. And Dylan yeah. Strom is going to be UFA. Yeah. You guys love Dylan Strom. Do I? I I'm the one who liked Dylan. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Don't lump me in with I that. Dylan, I think he's I think, fine. I've, con- I think Dylan I've confused Strom would be him a really with with uh, Kirby guy. Doc. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, I think Dylan Strom would be a a, a very productive middle. And six speaking guy, of so. Kirby Doc, Hardcore Luchador said, "Felix, how happy are you with Montreal's work today?" I'm confused. <laughs> I'm just very confused. The Kirby Doc thing threw me for a freaking loop. I had a crazier reaction to that than the Slavkovsky pick. Because that was That's somewhat fair. expected. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I it's not at all what I would have done, but it is. There's a chance it works, so I'm gonna I'm gonna watch. I'll follow. Sith Lord Buscemi said, uh, "What do you think the ETA of Minchukov and Gauthier is? Or is it Gauthier? Gauthier? I don't know. Gauthier. I'm probably, Gauthier. Whatever. I feel like Gauthier might be in a web D sooner than we think." Maybe for Gauthier, just because, like, I don't know how much more development runway he really has in the QMJHL. I don't think he's going to be in the NHL next year, though. I mean, it seems pretty unlikely. I mean, maybe. Um, if they just want, like, a cheap depth guy and, and they think that he's he's ready for it. As far as Michukov, I think that he's probably still got at least a year so- to, to develop. Goshe is going to be AHL AHL eligible next season, as in the season after this one, because he's a November birthday. Yeah, yeah. So I think that they they probably drafted him with kind of future depth in mind. But if he's NHL ready and he's just like a cheap, good young kind of depth Ooh. piece, that might not be the end of the world either. Both Minchukov and uh, Goshe are eligible to be in the AHL for the what would that be 2023-2024 season. So they only they only need to be in junior for one more year. Yeah, because they're yeah. both November birthdays. Yeah, well, that's kind of the critique with Goshe is that his production doesn't really match kind of where you think he would be at with his with his runway that he has. But yeah, I think it's going to be at least a year. I would say. I mean, I think we're going to they they might get games. I mean, I think Mintukov might get some games this year, but ultimately, as full timers, it's going to take it's going to take another year, I would say. Yep. T Unit One Four Two Seven says, "What would you trade for Puyu Yarvi?" I mean, you kind of said it, but it doesn't sound like it's going to take very much. I I would do Comtois for Puyu Yarvi. Oh, I would do that. Is that an overpay? I mean, it might be an overpay with how people are talking about yeah Puyo, the the trade value. Yeah. Max Jones for for Puyo Max I mean, Jones would be would be a yes for me. Coltwa, I'd still be a little hesitant because I feel like you can get more out of him like once his value. It's it's selling low. Yeah, it's yeah. selling low, and like Puyo, I know everyone likes Puyo Yarvi. So Max Jones. Well, although Max to be Jones, fair, I, I, although to be fair, Coltwa's shown more than Max Jones at least. Yeah, like what's the what's like the sell high on on Max Jones? Like he's healthy and he's like a fourth liner. Uh, that doesn't get hurt. It's just like, I think Contois, there's at least that offensive upside that you can maybe go and, and recover that value. So yeah, I, Contois for Pouli RV just feels like a weird trade to me because maybe Contois actually rebounds and becomes a decent player. And maybe Pouli RV doesn't look quite as good in Anaheim. Like I, it seems like a weird swap to me. Here's my I mean, question. Not- knowing, knowing the way, the Edmonton Oilers work. Do you think Sam Steele alone would get it done? Possibly <laughs> that is a yes. because of the Edmonton. Yes. I thought Derek Grant might do it alone, to be honest. Sam Steele is a yes. For I me. think Sam Steele alone would get it done. I yeah. think Sam well, Steele had Ed- a better Edmi- Edmonton boy coming home. Yeah. He had a better season than maybe he's gotten some credit, but he's still just He's not that dude. Yeah. yeah. Drizzy, Drizzy Drew, uh, 1992, said, uh, should the Ducks target the highest-rated goal, ranked goalie available? 
I think he's no. talking about in the draft. No, I think they're I think they're good. I don't think they really they, need to they've go got out of a their decent way. goalie pipeline right now. Yeah. yeah. By the way, that guy Bobski's trying to chime in to say Sakura is not Peterson. Unrelated. Yeah. Uh, okay. PC Main said, said, which is worse, Deloria coming back to a- back or Kane to Anaheim? Let's just go with the worst of the two Canes. Evander and go with, Kane? Yeah, let's go with Evander oh, Kane. Oh, yeah, Evander Kane coming to Anaheim would be yeah. way worse. Because at worse. least Nick Deloria, by all accounts, is a good dude. Yeah. yeah. he's. A, he, I mean, he was very popular in the locker room. He had the whole protection thing forever, that much uh, that worth. Kane's been run out of almost every single locker that he's been in. He's obviously got the sexual assault allegations, yeah. a ton of other... Like, he just comes with way too much baggage. Doesn't seem like a good dude. I don't care how many points he puts up. I is don't that, want that guy on my team. Is that who you want around your young players? No. no probably not. Yeah, I would way rather have Delorier in the offensive black hole he is than... than... <laughs> <laughs> deal with Kane. Pre Pismic says, "Do the du- how do the Ducks reach the salary floor?" Well, they're going to have money. To either resign Done. their Next guys question. or just go out and get a bunch of free agents. But it doesn't look like there's going to be a big trade. R- really yeah, quick, so- spe- speaking of taking on a co- bad contract, um, just need to get this out there. What the fuck is David Poyle thinking? He oh, is this the Ryan McDonough thing? Yeah. Like taking on Ryan McDonough and not getting an asset back for taking on that deal. He wants Der- He wants Ryan McDonough. Though. I know, but you still have to get like he gave up assets. Yeah, he still thinks to the get four more open. years. Of Ryan McDonough. McDonough is a top four defenseman on a Stanley Cup final oh slash God. winning team. Jake, he's a he, minute muncher. Oh he's a my. glue guy. He's like Kevin Shattenkirk. Your evaluation he's... of like <laughs> your your you give NHL GMs a lot of credit. For like get, properly valuing the market. I mean, I don't because I'm the one that says John Gibson is going to get like a massive return because I think GMs can be dumb. But I also think that this is insane. Absolutely insane. Uh, Fired Carlisle says, do the Ducks qualify for Sam Steele? Q a deadline is Monday is what he's saying. I'm not I sure. I think they that. do. I think they do. Why yeah. wouldn't they? I mean, what's the number? Like a million and a half or something. It's not a lot. Yeah. Like he, he took some strides, I think, last season defensively. If you look at the tracking data, like he was actually really good at getting the puck out of the defensive zone and good at transitioning the puck. So he's taken some steps to at least just be like a fine depth piece. Like he's still definitely not like a game breaker or anything. He's don't think he's going to get there, but cheap depth pieces are needed. Yep. Uh, I am looking and I'm not really seeing any other questions. Uh, Mighty Duck 86 saying Sam Steele for PRV do that without even thinking twice. Yeah. Oh, Fire Carlisle. Would you do Milano for PRV? No. No. I mean, the thing with Milano is like, is he going to get to play with the True. Ducks? <laughs> like, is it worth trading him just to get someone who will actually get to play? Well, here's the thing. If, 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 uh, I agree. If Milano is not going to get to play if the Ducks organization and Dallas Aikens are going to refuse to like really give him his due. Well, clearly yeah, Aikens doesn't well. like him because he, after Murray left, it was still, it was, it got almost worse with like his playing time and the scratching and all of that. Yeah. The thing is, is that Sonny Milano has way more to me offensive upside than uh, Jesse Pugliarvi. Jesse Pugliarvi, I think kind of is what well, he Pugliarvi's is. Pugliarvi's younger, now. right? Like he's, he's so good defensively. Pugliarvi, is about the same age, maybe a year younger. Um, it's really not much of a difference. Double check for me on that. But again, Pulley RV has like yeah. the elite defensive impacts. Like it, he would be great for that. But again, Sonny Milano just has so much more of an offensive upside that I think at this point, it would be a bad idea to trade him unless you know that he's not going to get any playing time for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, Milano is going to be 27 this upcoming season by the end of this okay. next season. And I forgot he was that old. Pulley RV is going to be yeah, 25. He's, the, he's older than you think. Yeah. yeah. He's going to be 25. So honestly, I, I think I might actually trade Milano for Pulley RV just not because I don't like Milano, but because I don't see a path to him getting the, the, the love he needs to, to play in the, consistently. I would rather not do it. This is more of like a pragmatic, like, uh, you know, at least just get get someone who will play who can add value. But I like Milano's skill set a lot better than I like Pugliarvi's because Pugliarvi 
put up really good results last year, but he's just like more of a, like CJ was saying, like a defensive specialist, you know, like a really good guy retrieving pucks at creating plays for others, you know, like in small areas, but not really a guy who's going to shoot a lot or create a lot of plays for others, like offensively in dangerous areas. So we shall see. Yep. I think that is it in terms of the questions. Any other closing thoughts? Uri Slavkovsky is going to be the best player out of this draft. Oh, uh, how, long, <laughs> how long did it take you to change your, your tune from I'm going to go jump off a bridge? It, it was in between uh, the last question from the Twitch chat and you asking that question. <laughs> Uri Slavkovsky is going to be the best player in this draft. Um, Kirby Doc is going to become an elite, you know, two, you know, 1B center. And yeah, I, I great job by the Habs. Can't um, use. I'm gonna tell you right now, uh, uh, Pavel Mintjukov is going to become the next Scott Niedermeyer um, <laughs> for the Ducks. You can book his number to the rafters right now. <laughs> I was just so upset when the Canadians traded Romanov and 98th overall pick to get up into that 13th pick, and it was like, oh, this is a great, this is a great trade, and then all of a sudden. They traded, they traded that to get Kirby Doc, and I was like, no, you were so close. You were almost <laughs> there. You almost nailed it, and somehow you found a way to screw it up. Uh, no, I, I don't like that, but I'm all in. Marty St. Louis can, can develop. He could develop my game in the NHL. He can make me an NHLer. I believe, I believe in, in, the, in the prowess there. Okay. I think we should get out of here. It is uh, well past the usual time that we end these things. It's almost 10 p.m. Any any other closing t- thoughts, you guys? Anything else you want to say? Um, just wanted to plug our Discord. That that guy Bobsky did a really uh, great thing today, setting up a Zoom watch party, uh, for the draft for everyone in our Patreon Discord. So those are things you can go do. Felix was in there. Uh, I've heard that his reaction to them taking Slavkovsky was entertaining. Yeah, yeah. I had a. I think my reaction to the the Kirby Doc trade was actually worse. Or worse slash better depending how you want to look at it than the Slavkovsky because that I just did not see that coming whatsoever um but a huge thank you to everyone who's followed along you know this has been a pretty busy week for us here at the podcast uh having you know setting up guests having these these episodes trying to give you guys as much content as possible but we love it we're going to keep doing it and if you want to help us keep it going as much as possible there's a few easy ways for us to do that check out our patreon patreon.com slash crash the pond uh, over there for $1 a month, a monthly pledge of $1, you get access to our Discord, which Jake has talked about. It's an awesome, awesome, thriving community. Fellow diehard Ducks fans, I, I absolutely recommend that you that you check that out. Uh, it's You'd be hard-pressed to find worse, uh, better ways to spend just $1. Now, for $5 a month, you get that, and you get access to two bonus episodes. So we're actually recording one tomorrow night. Uh, we do league-wide topics. We do rankings, playoff predictions, all sorts of good stuff. I'm not exactly sure what we're talking about tomorrow, but I'm sure we'll have something probably draft related. We're going over the entire Ducks draft. Oh, that's right. (laughs) There you go. There you go. Bury the lead. Uh, My brain is absolute mush right now. Um, But yeah, so this, so, so check that out and you can also make a $15 month monthly pledge if you really want to support us to that level. Um, But that you don't have to pledge any money though, to help us keep this thing going. Check us out on Apple podcasts. Uh, you know, search for the podcast, crash the pond and leave us a rating and a review. And at the end of each show, if there's a new review, we'll read it on the air. You know, the more inside jokes you can mix in, the better. We really appreciate and and really value hearing from you guys. Uh, You can also find us on Spotify, leave us a rating there. And you can also find us on YouTube, youtube.com slash crash the pond. We are on there. Make sure to subscribe there and turn on the notifications, uh, check out our website, crashthepond.com. Lots of good content going up there. Really easy place to, to kind of keep track of what's going on this off season. News wise, uh, crash the pond's also on Twitter at crash the pond. CJ's on Twitter at CJ Woodling. Ooh. One thing I want to add is keep an eye on crashthepond.com tomorrow. We're going to have an article probably go up for every single draft pick that goes up with a little blurb about yep. uh, what each player is. So if you're looking for essentially a quick hitter on this player, giving you essentially a breakdown of what different people are saying about him, that's essentially what's going to be on the article. So kind of giving you all of your information in one source. 
Yep, and Jake is on Twitter at ReindeerGames91. I'm on Twitter at Felix underscore Sicard. That is going to do it for us tonight, guys. That is going to do it for the first round of the NHL draft. Wow, can't believe that that's already over. It was a lot of fun, but there's plenty more to talk about. The offseason is just beginning. We'll talk to you next time. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. Bye.